All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the session on urban church planting. Let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, so maybe any one of us can lead in prayer. Zeli, would you like to lead in prayer, please? Yes, sure, Pastor. Let's pray. Father, we come before your presence in the name of Jesus as we begin our class, Lord. You bless each one of us. You bless our pastor so that he can teach the word of God according to your will and Lord Jesus. Whatever words proceed of his mouth, Lord, it will bring, Lord, a uh, new revelation insight in each one of us, Lord. We thank you for each of our classmates. Bless each one of us, Lord. You give us the spirit of wisdom and understanding so that we can grasp what you have for us, Holy Spirit, this day, Lord. We commit our life, everything into a caring to Lordship. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Man, thank you so much, Teddy. All right, so we've covered quite a lot uh, of ground up to now. We we looked at strategies of how we can, you know, develop, build churches, evangelism, urban missions. Uh, then we looked at how we are called to target different age groups. Uh, you know, Yes, God is calling us to do ministry, but we must also be wise, right? Uh, we mean we need to plan, we need to prepare ourselves for ministry. So we looked at different areas or different age groups. So we could get uh, children, teens, young adults, young couples, uh, elderly couples, men's ministry, women's ministry, single adults ministry. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there's so much. Uh, different demographics of areas that we are called to reach out to. Uh, then, last class, we looked at, very important, the seven spheres of influence, or the seven mountains. Uh, you can use both of them are the same, synonymous. Um, uh, now, not all churches, uh, if you look at it globally right now, not all churches, uh, you know, identify or, you know, they they keep up with the seven spheres of influence, meaning they don't agree with it. Sometimes uh, some of them say, hey, there's nothing like seven spheres. It's just, you know, we are called to reach out in every sphere. Uh, but we must understand that these seven spheres, it's, it may not be written in the Bible, but these are, this is just a way for us as, uh, you know, that uh, we came up with this, uh, uh, the seven spheres is for us to penetrate into these different areas of society, right? So the seven spheres of mountains we looked at was education, um, arts and entertainment, media, business, government, family, and religion. Those are seven spheres, right? And we learned last class that uh, new ways of ministry, new ways of reaching out to all these spheres, all these seven mountains must be encouraged within the church. Now, we must understand that, you know, especially if you, you've just planted your church, you just started, uh, and when you begin with something, it you may not have too many people there, right? You may not have everyone sitting and, uh, you know, reaching out to all these spheres. But over time, as the church grows, look at opportunities right so i have shared a few examples last class on how uh, you know even in the initial years itself one two years after apc was founded we got opportunities to reach out to different places in the city then 2008 we got opportunities to get into colleges and schools as a catalyst program so uh these are opportunities that we must look forward to pray for and once the opportunity those are open we get into it pray prepared and uh, and reach out right we looked at uh, the two well, the two, two points one was the challenge and two is the process right uh, and three was sorry preparation four was positioning ourselves to what god wants us to do so today we'll get into a very important aspect and i think all of us uh, you know as as church pastors or church leaders ministry leaders uh, we want to see is growth right now growth is a sign of fruitfulness right uh, uh, growth is not on the only sign but it is one of the signs of fruitfulness right so today we look at chapter 14 
growth and consolidation. Uh, what is what is consolidation? Consolidation means to strengthen what you already have. Right now, as a church, once you plant a church or a ministry, right, you're small, but you love to see growth. You want to see people, more people coming into the church. You want to see the church growing, volunteer teams growing, new teams coming into place. It's exciting, right? When you see new people coming in, getting plugged in. Uh, aligning with the vision of the church it's very very exciting right you feel encouraged you feel really strong feel that hey god is here with me and god is going to bring more people into our midst so that's wonderful right if you speak to any pastor in this world none of the pastors will say i don't want church growth everyone will love to see a church grow right so let's look at a few aspects when it comes to growth and consolidation now remember that our focus should not only be on church growth church growth is good we need it but we must also consolidate meaning strengthen what we have we need to focus on those who are already there there will be people coming to your ministry coming to the church who are still babies in christ we need to develop them we need to take them to a place of maturity preaching teaching of the word this is all very critical right so uh, remember as pastors don't focus only on church growth it's one of the aspects of fruitfulness but we also look at consolidating strengthening what you already have now just like in the natural right there are stages of growth uh, when you look at a natural human body there are stages right uh, the same way growth in the church happens in stages Right, and we need to be sensitive to what God is doing at each stage in the local church. Right, consolidate what God establishes in the local church community at each stage, and then press forward. Right, so don't allow. I like this point here. Don't allow the congregation to become comfortable in a particular stage. Uh, right, so, so for example. You planted the church. Now it's five years down the line. You've got 300 people in the church. Don't allow the congregation to feel that, hey, we've achieved 300. It's a good number. It's Now we are a growing church. It's wonderful. We have all the teams that are there. And make the congregation feel comfortable. Now, when I'm saying comfortable, I'm not talking about the physical comfort of, you know, just uh you know uh sitting in good chairs or the ac and all of that i'm not talking about that i'm saying uh, a, a place of rest there should always be this desire to know more a desire to grow more uh in the things of god as a local church community to continue to grow both in numbers and in things of the spirit right so just as the human body goes through stages of growth right the church also goes through stages of growth. Now, as a pioneer, as a pastor, we must be very sensitive to what God is doing in our communities at each stage. All right. So first one, let's look at the, uh, right now we have five stages here mentioned. So let's look at each stage and uh, uh, build a few points here, right? First one is the pioneering stage. Right now we looked at it right the pioneering stage is the stage where uh, you, you pray you plan you prepare you have a core team uh, you establish the territory the place the, you got the vision you got the mission um, you have your first sunday service you pioneer the church laying the groundwork is the most essential part of a church the pioneering Look at this in the natural. If we have to build a 30 floor building, the foundation needs to go way deep down inside. Now, nobody is going to look at the foundation and say, oh, what a beautiful foundation. The foundation is nothing. It's, it's just dug down deep. Now, imagine. You know, only after the floors that are built and we see the completion of the building and say, hey, wow, what a wonderful building, 30 floors. But nobody's appreciating the foundation because 
the foundation is insignificant it doesn't look nice but is the foundation important extremely important without the foundation the building is not even going to stand the building may look good but with a bad foundation what's going to happen it's just going to fall off it's not going to be a strong building so just like that in a church when you have pioneered a church think of it as a foundation look at a foundation it's it's not it doesn't look really good it's not something that everyone are going to applaud but that is very important sometimes we may feel okay uh, you know i want to be like this church we may compare ourselves oh this church is you know they they look so nice everything's so nice the music is so nice the worship is so nice the the equipment the sound you know, the 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 venue the uh the, the everything is so nice the teams uh we may want it that way but remember you're still in the foundation you're still in a place of digging down deep there may not be a lot of applause there may not be a lot of appreciation but remember that it is very critical it is very important to have a strong foundation remember what we talked about in the uh, first service in the first service lay down your vision your mission and what you want to do what you do in the first service is going to continue throughout right so it is the foundation that is the that is laying the stage setting the preparation for the things to come ahead imagine this if a foundation is not good imagine this a foundation is very weak and there's a fierce wind and this building just falls down is it is it uh, are people going to say hey you know what this is such a beautiful building why did it fall down no they're going to say hey maybe this this building was not built strong enough because you look at the other houses they are standing but just a little bit of wind has come and this building has fallen people are going to question the engineer and the architect the engineer of that whole say what did you do why why is this building so weak did you not go down did you, was your foundation not uh, strong enough remember this the deeper you go in your foundation the higher you can rise up right a strong and a deep foundation is required for future growth right so if you set certain principles right from the beginning saying this is what i will do in the pioneering stage is what you're doing you are setting the foundation of the church years will go by soon we will pass on the mantle to somebody else but what's going to happen the foundation is still strong look at this example right in the bible moses god chose moses now i'm not talking about i'm just talking about this importance of the foundation and uh, in, in terms of ministry look at Moses God chose Moses God told Moses come on I'm going to bring the people out of Egypt and I'm going to do signs wonders and miracles and he did it he brought the people out of Egypt and it was time for him to pass the mantle on and the mantle went on to Joshua do you think right the people the Israelites have seen these wonderful miracles of God they've heard about it do you think they would not have thought okay you know what even joshua must be able to do these wonderful miracles even joshua must be able to uh, minister to the people the same way moses did they would have thought that why because moses laid the foundation right the same way in 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 the church when we lay a good foundation that's going to continue on stronger and stronger if you got a church that you know is united from day one you say hey we're all united it doesn't matter what language what culture what race what uh, work uh, or, or our standing in society all of this don't matter when we enter the church we are one body we're all one and so from the foundation stage you're saying that 
imagine this and a church comes up to 300 400 or 500 people there's a sense of unity why because foundations are strong imagine this as a church in the initial pioneering stage you say you know you're faithful with the money that god is giving you you're being transparent you're informing the church okay this is what we need for this is what uh, you're giving this is how much we have received this is what we have spent it for they're being transparent and faithful with the money that god has placed in your hand what will happen years down the line the foundation is strong so people will continue to trust and it's important that we keep that trust right because foundation has been laid right so build a strong foundation sometimes you know we are in a hurry to start a ministry because it's exciting right oh i want to start yeah but when you start make sure that you have these principles set out make sure that as a person as a leader set certain guidelines set yourself right? uh, have rules and guidelines that you yourself you and i should follow right this is what i will do if this situation comes this is what i will do or if if the enemy comes up with this kind of a situation this is what i will stand with right you set certain guidelines set uh, boundaries for your own life and don't cross over those boundaries remember as a leader right when we start the church it is our life and character that is very important our life and character will speak right so uh, this is uh, you know uh, we must dig deep and lay a good foundation right second one administrative organizational and structural stage now when a church has just begun you may have 20 30 people 50 but the moment you go above 50 people now i'm just giving an example right 50 people uh you and I have to assign roles and responsibilities. We need to define systems and processes to make sure that the church is functioning effectively. Right? Understand this. The church is also an organization. Right? It's not a business, but it's an organization. You need, we need to organize it the right way. We must have good administrative skills to handle it right? did moses and his team have good administration skills definitely were they able to organize this whole you know millions of people they were able to organize they had structures in place they knew that okay when this tribe goes the second tribe will be this okay and this is the trumpet they will stay back this is the trumpet to gather the leaders this is the trumpet to move on so everything was organized right? and if you even if you look at uh, the levitical offerings organized it was not like anybody could come and give their offerings no there was different kinds of offerings very organized right there was the guilt offering sin offering pain offering uh, uh, grain offering every offering had certain rules and guidelines there was, there was it was already set in place and you look at the New Testament, in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus himself, he had an administration, 12 people. He organized them. One of them was, you know, would keep the money, right? Judas himself, right? Okay, so probably he went to Judas and said, Judas, we just went to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Samarita, Samaria and we came back. What was the amount that we spent? I'm sure Jesus would have asked, right? He would have kept a track of what's happening. Right? Uh, it may not be given in the Bible, but I'm sure Jesus would have done it. Okay, so this is what we have got uh, from the funds that have been given by the people. Um, and this is what we spent on our food and our uh, shelter. And this is the money that we blessed others with. So what is remaining now? He would have had uh, administration, right? Now, it is very important to assign roles and responsibilities for various ministries that the Lord may uh, release in our midst, right? Uh, now, as you assign these roles and responsibilities, right, 
no, for example, you you got fifty people in your church. The church is growing, and then suddenly there's an opportunity to start, uh, let's say, children's church. They say, okay, we're going to start children's church because fifty families are coming. We have about ten children. Let's start children's church. And what are you going to do? You know, as a pastor, you have to have the right people to teach children's church. We cannot teach in the main church and go back to the children's church. So what must I do? I need to raise up the right people, raise up the right leaders. OK, for children's church, we will assign two people. These are the two. Maybe it could be a husband and wife, or it could be just uh, two uh, people who will who two leaders who will look after the children's church. Now, remember that is in the initial phase, it's not always we'll get trained people, you know, who've gone through all the trainings. No. You look at people, they are faithful, you give them opportunities, right? And they learn, they grow on the job, right? While they're doing it, while they're preparing, they will learn, right? So, so assign a children's church coordinator. Then your church is growing. You've got 70, 100 people. In those 100, you've got 30 people who are youth. OK, so 30 youth. They can't just be sitting in the church and going back home. But we need to have some youth meetings. We need a youth leader, somebody who can recognize right, what's happening in the, you know, just walk with them, understand them uh, you know, at their wavelength. So we assign a youth leader. So this youth leader is going to look after all the youth. He can have youth meetings, all the other things, right? And this youth leader must also look, you know, be accountable to the main pastor, the the senior pastor, right? So you got now you've got senior pastor, you got children's church coordinator, and you've got a youth pastor, right? Now as the church grows. You get 150 people. Now you have about 60 youth. So you understand, OK, the youth leader must be able to, youth pastor must be able to start youth leaders, to have about two or three youth leaders who can also minister to everyone, who can oversee the youth as well. Right? So, so we put processes in place. Right? So what happens is, even if you're small, 100 people, when you put these processes in place, as you grow, you will know how to handle the situations. You will know how administratively you'll be very strong. No, hey, this is, and even as you do this, you will understand and learn, OK, this thing worked, this doesn't work. right? So you can make improvements, but you set processes in place. right? Then, for example, there's an opportunity to plant a new church. So again, you do the same thing what you do in pioneering stage. You set up, you ask the church, OK, let's have a core team, right? five people. Go out, reach out, minister to people there, be there to pray, locate an area, plant the church. Right? So, so what happens is, even if your church becomes 1,000 people, administratively, everything is strong. Right. So what do we do? Uh, let me give you a few examples. What do we do at APC? Right Now, this is just examples, uh, but you can come up with your own uh, ideas and solutions and ways to be administratively strong. Now, if, if you've seen the structure, what we have is senior pastor, associate pastors, ministry leaders, volunteer leaders, and congregation. Right? So that's a structure in place. Now, for example, you know we want to hire something for an event. Right? This is an example, right? We want to hire, uh, f you know, tables, and we need to order food. We're having a one-day conference, right? So, what do we do? Number one. So, for example, right? I, I look after even the men's ministry at APC. So, so let me give you an example. If we have a one-day men's conference. What are we going to do? Number one, OK, we set the date. We know the date. OK, this is the date, September 15th, men's conference. It's already gone out in the calendar. Right? So the, the, the firstly, I need to send the message right, to the congregation. 
right? Uh, so I'm just giving you a structure, okay? So we have many things in place. You don't have to follow all of it, right? But these are uh, structures which really helped us, right? Over time, it's happened. So first is uh, there's a, there's an emailer called Save the Date, right? So an email goes to the entire congregation saying, Men's Conference, September 15th, save the date. That's it. Nothing more than that. Two is it goes out on the Sunday announcements, video announcements. Even as it goes out, then the following week is the message, WhatsApp message to the all the men of ABC. The WhatsApp message will include the registration link, the price, and all the details. Right. Four, the IT team prepares for all the you know all the registrations that happen. It it goes uh, via online, and uh, it, there's also some who would like to pay uh, in person at the venue. So we leave that option open. Right. So registration start. Then in the middle, after a, a week or so, we send one more uh, message saying. A gentle reminder, if you haven't registered for the men's conference, please go ahead and register. And then finally, we, you know, a couple of days before the event, uh, we send them uh, an appreciation thing. Uh, thank you for registry, registry, registering for the conference. And we just resend the details. OK, here is the conference. This is the timing. This is the agenda. And it everything is set in place. So for the conference, now that I know the conference is happening, I know that I'm going to have about 100 people coming for the conference, so I need to set teams. So we have sound and setup, we have the IT team, we have the media team, we have the graphics team. There's so much that happens, right? Uh, so all of these teams are involved for one conference. right? And as, as a ministry leader, what I do is I send budget approvals right so so this is the budget for the conference right it's going to cost about this much we get approvals for that budget so why is all this needed everything is done on email right uh, it's documented why is all this needed so that administratively we are strong and we know okay this is the structure the moment we think okay there's a conference coming these are the things involved and everything runs smoothly. Nobody's going to say, oh, man, who's going to do PPT for the conference? No, it's all arranged maybe a month before. We know who's going to do PPT. Who's going to be uh, involved in the food uh, coupons? And all? We know a month before. It's already ready. right? Who's going to be he helping with the parking, uh, you know, parking of cars? And we know. All teams are set in place administratively. It is organized. It's already set in place, right? Now, this didn't, I'm not saying that when we started APC itself, you know, two, three years down the line, we were so strong. No. Over time, we were able to come up with these strategies and ideas. But this emailer, the WhatsApp, uh, you know, bulk messages were done from 2001. 2001, from the time we started. Uh, we used to send email, right? So it's not something new. So we do it even now. Right? 22 odd years later, we still do it. Emailers, bulk messages sent. Right? So what happens is there is organized, there, it is structured. Everything we do is structured. Even if you look at a church service, it's structured. We start at 10 30. 10.30 worship, 9.15. Of course, even as we are structured, we do open, keep it open for the Lord to minister. There are times we may extend, so we're, we're not too stringent on that. But we have a structure in place. Right? Uh, I hope everyone is getting what I'm saying, right? Uh, it's, not, it's not that you have to do it this way initially, but it's good. It's good to start small. If you have a youth leader, Right, you have twenty youth or fifty youth under that youth pastor. Train the pastor. Tell him, see, organizationally, this is what we will do. In the year, there will be one youth camp and two youth meetups. 
camp will be for three days or two days or three days. Youth meetings will be half yearly. So what are you doing? You're setting it in place. So you're telling the youth pastor, this is how you should do it. And the, the youth pastor goes ahead and raises up leaders to make sure all of this structure is followed. Right? Uh, it may look complicated, but it's really not. Right? If you're used to it, you know, you get used to something, you keep doing it, it's helpful. And you know what happens is your work becomes fruitful. It's not like you know you have a conference, uh, you have 100 people, but uh, hey, I thought 200 will come. I've ordered food for 200 people. No, you know 100 people are coming. So you order food for 100 people. There's no wastage, right? There's no waste of uh, food, no waste of money, done well, right? So new ministries can be birthed by the Spirit in two ways. Look at that here. The Lord gives a vision of what needs to be done. And as you declare that vision, God stirs up people and they step into the role to carry it out. Right? So for example, you're at church, God gives you a vision, you know, God is calling us. I feel that God is ministering to us and he wants us as a church to reach out to the corporate sectors. Example, right? Reach out to the corporate, those who are light in, in the society reach out to the corporate so you begin to put that vision out out of the hundred people in your church there will god may speak to two, one or two of them who are in the corporate sector saying maybe i wish i could do something they'll come and speak to you you know i wish i could do something is there something that i can do i'm available saturdays i'm free or monday to friday if you're if you feel there's something that i can do a new ministry can be birthed out of it or God can speak, the pastor may say, uh, you know, I feel that God is calling us to minister to the um, home for the aged, to reach out to them, to be a help to them. God can open a door. A new ministry can be birthed. Colleges, schools, right? same way, right? So that is one way. Two, the Lord may raise up or send people with certain gifts and callings, and you recognize these gifts and callings and give them opportunity. And so what are the two ways? One way is you share the vision. God ministers to people's heart and they come and, you know, they want to align with that. Two is there'll be people in your church and you see the potential, you see the gifts and the callings and the things that they can do. And as a pastor, you recognize it and you get them to, you know, uh, it's, it's not like you're saying you have to do it. You give them the opportunities, right? I remember this young man uh, uh, in church, this young boy, a young boy. He would come to church, and immediately after church, he would run away. Right. So this one day, uh, this is not in Bangalore, it's in another city. And this one day, uh, I decided I, I need to speak to this boy. So immediately after church, I went up to him and I said, hey, uh, you always run, you know, you're always in a hurry. What do you do? Uh, you know, I began to talk to him. Any reason? He said, no, I'm very shy. You know, I, I don't like to talk to many people. And uh, he was a young boy and he was very shy because we had a lot of youth in our church, boys and girls. So he was very shy. It's OK. It's all right. right? It, it's, it's a natural thing to be shy. I could understand that. Right. So I said, OK, don't worry. Uh, why don't you come? Just stay around. Maybe some some of them, some of the boys and the girls are there. You can just talk, just just get to know each other. Or oh, why don't you come for a youth meeting? And so he came for the youth meeting, right? Uh, one of the youth meetings. He stayed back. He really liked it. And what I understood was this boy was a brilliant drummer. He has been playing drums from the time he's six years old, right? There was a drum kit in the church, but nobody was there to play, right? And so after the youth meeting, he just sat on the drum kit and he started playing the drums so well. So I asked him, hey, you're a drummer. He said, yeah, I've been playing for quite some time now. And he was really good. And then we got him to audition. He got through. And he started playing drums in the church every Sunday. Finally, he ended up becoming a youth leader. Right. Uh, and he started teaching others music. And he was the first one in the church. He would open the church. He would do everything in the church. The first one to run away. Right? Sometimes, you know, people will 
not understand what is there inside of them, right? And as pastors and leaders, we need to be sensitive. We say, hey, this person can. This person has the potential to be, you know, maybe to do the declaration or maybe to start a life group, a cell group, or, uh, uh, you know, or to, uh, you know, a potential to be a leader in, in this area. We recognize it and we give them opportunities, right? So again, this recognizing, even as we choose people, right, it's important that we train them. Right. So, for example, what I do is I also look after life group ministries, that is cell groups. Uh, so all the life groups, whether you are 10 years in the Lord, 20 years in the Lord, one month in the Lord, every life group leader will have to go through the life group leaders training. And they have to go through it right? and go through the life group leaders training. And only then they get become a life group leader. We don't just randomly say, OK, start your life group. No, they go through a training. Right. So uh, so there are, these are certain guidelines that we have set and we follow it because it's good. Right. Uh, and last one here, establish a reproducible model so that new church plants can replicate these things and start. Right. So if this is what I'm following in this church, when I have a new church plant, I will follow the same way because I see that there is fruit. Right? Now, again, when you start a church plant, it's not that initially you'll, if you will have like conferences and all of it, it may take some time. Right? It may take some time to have a youth leader. There's no point of having a youth leader when you have five people in church or 10 people. It needs to grow, needs to come to a certain place, but you replicate the whole thing. Right. So one of the things that we do at all our locations is the same. So most of you may have watched our service online, right? The service, the central service. It is it, the same thing that happens at all our locations. Right. So for example, starts with worship. The pastor comes up, the Lord's table, announcements. So a couple of announcements we reiterate. If there is baby dedication. Uh, or, or anything we do at that time declaration the word of god ministry time close same pattern so if you go to any of our locations apc location any location it is the same thing all the locations have a welcome team sound and setup team first time visitor ushering team we follow the same process for the first time visitors we have uh, uh, you know, uh, offering counting team, same thing, all locations, right? Why? Because the first one was good. Organizationally, it was good. It was fruitful. It was effective. Follow the same thing at all locations, right? Rosalind has a question. Uh, if the life group training, is the life group training available on the APC website for us to go through? Uh, so. Rosalind, we have a document for the life group leaders training. We don't have the document on the website, uh, but what will happen is next semester, we have a topic called uh, discipleship and small groups. Uh, and so you'll learn more on that, right? Uh, how to disciple in small groups. So, but to answer your question, we don't have the life group training manual on the website. Uh, yeah. So it's only when people, uh, life group leaders, want to start, we take them through the training, we share the document, and uh, yes. But if you'd like to, I can just email it to you separately, personally, if you'd like. To. If you really want to go through it, I, will, I can send it to you, no problem. Yeah. Okay, uh, so everyone with me, uh, administrative organizational structure, right? Uh, this will really set the stage for a beautiful, effective, powerful ministry. Right? Uh, set set this administrative things in place. Now, what about you know areas where you are leading? You may not be a pioneer. It's all right. So, for example, the church. There are hundred people in your church, and you know, the pastor says, "Hey, why don't you be the worship worship coordinator?" I, I want to be the coordinator of the worship uh, 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 team. So then it gives you an opportunity to 
come up with a strategy come up with um, you know being organized right and i'm sure you'll learn more in uh, worship ministry as well uh, on how to you know raise up good teams right that's a sign of a good leader okay so now that you have everything set in place right this is how we'll do it administratively as an organization this is how we are this is the structure we follow youth leaders or uh, team leaders will uh, will uh, will always report to the associate pastors associate pastors report to the senior pastors there's a structure in place now third one pastoral team stage team ministry and senior pastor stage right now as you as as a leader as a pioneer you know it's so interesting when and it's such a joy to see your church grow and you see young boys and girls all of a sudden they're growing into maturity not all of a sudden but over time they're growing into maturity and suddenly five years ten years down the line ten years have passed you've got a five-year-old boy or, or say you got an eight-year-old boy in sitting in Sunday school ten years have passed and this boy is 18 years old now you see that he's matured he's grown up and he becomes a leader in the church right now what must we do very important establish a leadership team to carry out several areas of ministry as the church grows the ministries will grow the doors will open new ministries start and that's good right there are times as leaders we must you know you know here's the thing we can choose certain ministries and some ministries we can say wait right again we need to be led by the holy spirit for that but establish leadership teams for the ministries right we talked about it right whether it's youth uh, uh, life groups men's ministry women's ministry teens ministry children's church establish teams remember that we cannot do everything on our own ministry is not a single it's, it's not a single-handed work it you need teams right now why do we need teams because if one person is not well imagine this you're a church of 200 people you've got about 70 children or keep 50 children in the children's church and if you have one children's church teacher that children's church teacher is unwell on sunday and cannot come what will the children's church do playtime no we should we should have a team so okay if they are not there somebody else can take over or picture this you have sound and setup you know that you have to go early morning church starts at 10 o'clock you should be there at least by seven o'clock set up all the equipment so by 9 9 15 you're done the the worship team comes there's sound check 10 o'clock you're able to start service now imagine you have two people in sound and setup how much can two people do you got speakers you got mics you got stage monitors right you got the mixer you got to lay out all the cables there's a lot of work and if they are not there say they say hey i'm traveling this week I'm going out of station to my hometown and you got one person in the sound and setup team what will happen it's going to be chaos right number one thing raise up ministry teams raise up teams if you look at uh you know what the apostle paul did we're talking about this in thessalonica the, in the book of thessalonians the letter he wrote see paul first missionary journey he chose barnabas and then from there he built teams second missionary journey paul timothy and silas paul and silas later joined by timothy right teams and then they further on went and built other teams right so teamwork is important right 
So one of the things that we always do is, if you have noticed, if you've watched online, if you see our video announcement that says volunteers needed, every now and then we put it up because there are volunteers needed. We have at APC, we have about 350 volunteers across all locations, 350 odd volunteers. You may be wondering, what do they do? They do a lot of work. The Most of it are done, most of the work is done by the volunteers. Right, so we just we go there, we preach, right, uh, and then we minister to people. But a lot of the background work is done by the volunteers. If not for them, we'll not be able to have an effective uh, experience in the church. Right, all the teams involved. So when you when you start teams, when you have team new ministries and new leaders, train your leaders to form teams. Because if we don't train them, the leader will feel, I can handle this on my own. He or she may be able to handle it on his own, but there'll come a time that ministry also will grow. And then we must have a team to handle it. But he cannot say, oh, OK, this is what I will do. I, I you know, uh, I, since I can't, I'm not there. Today, we'll not have service. We can't say that. We must be strong. We must be able to uh, form teams. And as you form these teams, the founding pastor goes into the senior pastor role. Right? So he gives overall vision, growth, direction, OK, what to do. Uh, and now this stage may happen after three years. It may happen after five years. It may happen after 10 years. right? But it, but it will happen. Right? It will happen as a founder, as a pioneer of the ministry. There will come a time right, that new ministries will start, new locations you may start. Uh, and then you'll move into this place of bringing overall o oversight. Right? If, if you look at what uh, Moses did, right? he did all, you know, he was doing a lot of things. And then his father-in-law came and said, why are you handling all of this? Don't you have teams? Don't you have leaders who can handle all this? Or you must be more, uh, you know, towards preparing and hearing from God and doing the ministry side of it. Why are you doing all these small things? Right? People have, you know, the Israelites were fighting with each other. They had problems. What problems? Small problems. Now these small problems they're coming to Moses. He took my uh, things, or she took my things. Uh, you know, small things they are fighting for. Moses is standing there and trying to solve these problems. That's when Moses's father-in-law comes and says, why are you doing this? You appoint leaders and you go and be in God's presence and you give overall uh, you know, vision and overall direction for what the Israelites must do. Right? So, so it's a biblical thing. Continuously create opportunities and rooms for developing to develop leaders and who are committed to the vision that god has given now here's the point for senior leaders not uh, pioneers spend time nurturing new believers like it's it it involves time it involves patience it involves being able to speak into their lives right so for example we have a new leader right uh, the church is 150 people you've appointed a youth leader and he does something wrong right so how are we going to nurture them how are we going to correct them are we going to say hey this is a big mistake you're out of this role no, we give them opportunities hey they're learning they just stepped into a new role so we nurture them, we train them, we develop them, spend time with them. Now, all of these efforts is something we must do. If we want a good team, we have to speak into their lives. We have to build them up, right? We have to be able to uh, come to a place where they are willing to, to hear because they've seen our lives. They've seen the fruit in our lives. They've seen the ministry working. And so uh, you know, be able to understand. Just the last point and we'll close. The more trust you give, the more faithful your leaders will be. Right? The more you trust your people, your leadership, the more faithful they be. If you know, if you keep treating them like school children, 
right? Did you do this? Did you do that? No. Give them responsibilities. Give them the role that they have to do. Give them the training that they require and tell them, hey, this is what needs to be done. And help them to get it done, right? Give, put your faith in them. Put your trust in them. Jesus did that to his disciples. And uh, and we'll we'll see we we'll see we'll see we'll pick up more from next class, uh, and we'll continue on this. But uh, yeah, so thank you so much. I know I've been talking a lot. I don't get time to hear from you all, but uh, we'll definitely take some time one of the classes to just hear your thoughts as well. Thank you so much for listening through this class. Uh, God bless you. Have a great week ahead. Yes, Rosalind, if you can just share your uh, email address. And uh, I think I should have it, so I'll email the document. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day ahead. God bless.